good evening to everyone. We're continuing uh, this week in our summer series, and uh, tonight we're going to be in uh, Luke, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 27 through 32, and we're talking about uh, Jesus dining with Levi. Now, uh, got, got some questions in here, so I hope you get some feedback from, from the audience on this. Uh, first, I, I would like to know, and, and I thought about this, and I actually did a little bit of research, read some pretty funny stories, but I'm wondering, have you ever had an awkward dinner with anyone? I hear the laughs and the smirks and the giggles, so uh, I'm sure that we've all had an awkward dinner of some sort. Uh, anybody care to share their awkward dinner moment? No, he's not sharing. All right, and, mo and most most people most people don't. Um, usually, you no, know, most of uh, the stories that I read. Uh, people were remembering uh, a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner, and it was typically with family that they saw like once a year, and they really didn't want to be there, or they didn't want someone else to be there, and they were there anyways, and it was awkward. Well, I wonder uh, in this situation here, Jesus dining with, with Levi, and we'll get into this, I wonder, you know, the awkwardness of the, the situation there in, in this dinner. Um, but let's go ahead and um, we'll read uh, our verses here. All right, so Luke, the fifth chapter, verse 27, beginning. It says, After this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's look at the, the background here uh, for uh, Levi. Uh, Levi, we see, was a tax collector, and he worked for the Roman government. And tax collectors were not uh, very popular uh, back in this time, and tax collectors are not very popular today either. Uh, as a tax collector, it's most likely that he had acquired a, a good amount of wealth. So even though Levi was Jewish, he probably didn't have a very strong allegiance to the Jewish people because of his position, because of his job. Unlike the other apostles, who most likely had a stronger tie to the Jewish community, Levi probably had severed that relationship by taking on this position as a tax collector and working for the Roman government, it, it would have been rare to find someone among the Jewish nation that had any positive thoughts at all about the Roman government. So with Jesus calling him into his inner circle, this could have been a wake up call for the other apostles who had already been called at that point. They most likely felt special. Think about it. Jesus, the coming Messiah, he chose me to come and be in his inner circle. And now Levi is joining the group. He's not like the other guys, okay? He's aligned with the Roman government because of his position, his job. And I just wonder how awkward that might have been for those others. The other apostles were seeing that Jesus was calling everyone, even those who were not very popular among their own. Uh, another thing to consider is that the other apostles 
could have chosen to turn away at this point. Okay? They had chosen to follow Jesus, and now Jesus is calling someone else who is not very popular, someone who is looked down upon. And so we're just reading between the lines here, but I do think it's something to consider. And perhaps we've been in this position ourselves, whether it's in some social aspect of life where you see someone that perhaps you would consider despicable, like Levi, and they're called to be among your exclusive group. Maybe it's at work or maybe some social circles or maybe a, a, a team that you are a part of, or perhaps even in our own church family, we have felt like this. We see someone who's marred and scarred and has a dirty background, and they're coming in to be a part of the family of God. When we have in our mind that everything is supposed to be clean and pristine. But Matthew was called, and Matthew didn't have to follow Jesus either. That was a choice that, that he made. Jesus said, follow me. And we're told that Matthew left everything and followed Jesus. And the other apostles are faced with a choice. Do I continue to follow Jesus or do I leave because I don't want to be associated with this guy who is considered to be deceiving and robbing people of their money? So it's a, really a twofold lesson there on making the right choice to follow Jesus. Matthew was called and he followed Jesus. The other apostles had an opportunity at any point to stop following Jesus, but they continued to follow Jesus. Now, let me ask a question. Why were tax collectors so unpopular? Yeah, we're going to look at this a little bit more as, as we, we go through, but uh, think, think about this. We're told that Levi is sitting at his tax booth. And so it's believed that, that Levi, in this position, he was probably collecting money from people that were coming and going from the city. They were bringing items to sell. They were buying items in the city. And as they were going, this was somewhat of a tariff, if you will. They were having to pay tax on the items they were buying and selling. So nobody want, wants to do that. We, we know all too well, you know, uh, we're, we're gonna get a toll road, right? Well, nobody wants a toll road because they don't wanna pay the fee on it. And that was Levi. He was kind of the, the toll keeper there. You had to pay to come through. And so like Walt said, uh, it, it is believed and it is, it's known uh, that the tax collectors were collecting more than what they were really supposed to collect. And for example, if someone was coming through and uh, they were to owe $10 for their taxes to the Roman government, the tax collectors might charge them $12 or $13 or $14. And they would turn that $10 into the Roman government and they would pocket the rest. And that was a common practice and everybody knew it, but what could you do? Matthew worked for the Roman government and the Roman government ruled everything. So you couldn't fight back against the, the Roman government. And so you just had to pay it knowing that you were really getting cheated out of your money. And so the, the Roman government allowed it. They were ultimately in charge and the people had no choice. And so we asked the question, like, who among us enjoys paying taxes? Anybody? Show of hands. Anybody like paying taxes? We, we, oh, coach, you enjoy paying taxes? Okay. What I was going to say is that I don't think we make it very clear how much these people hated the Roman government. Yes. You know, we see the collaborators of, of the best in Germany, what happened to some of those women, what happened to the men. Uh, of course, Matthew was killing folks, but he worked for an evil government just like those people. Hard to imagine the other, the other men accepted him, but I think that Jesus, you know, Jesus had a job for him, and I think 
Yes, I, I agree with you there. The Jews, that's a great lead in to, to my next section here. The Jews hated the tax collectors because they were aligned with the Roman government. It is likely that Levi was even hated by his own family because of this occupation that he had taken on. As a Jew, the Romans didn't like him either because they didn't like the Jews. And so Levi was just seen as a necessary instrument to be used by the Roman government to collect taxes for them. So he's in an awkward position. He's right there in the middle of all this ugliness that existed between the, the Jews and the Romans. The Jews didn't like him because they felt betrayed by him. He turned their back and gone to work for the Roman government. The Roman government didn't like the Jews, so they didn't really care for him either. And he's just right there in the middle of all of it. Well, let's move forward and we'll look at some more background. Levi is more commonly known as Matthew. We don't often refer to him as Levi. And we don't have a lot of background on Levi or Matthew other than he was a tax collector and, and we really don't know really where along the way his name changed uh, to, to Matthew but he is the, God, the author of the gospel of Matthew and he likely had been educated while you know trying to take on this role of this occupation to be a tax collector he had received some education there but his gospel, we, we read it, and we know that it's heavily rooted in Jewish history, and it's focused on bridging the gap between the old law and that new law that Jesus came to establish. And we read a parallel account of this over in, uh, in Matthew, the ninth chapter. But thinking about this, it's likely that he had a much higher level of education than most of the other apostles. Consider that several of the other apostles were fishermen. Now, there, there's nothing, nothing wrong at all with, with, with being a, a fisherman. In fact, uh, some of the classes I teach, uh, I, I used to, to joke about this a good bit. And I, I would tell everybody in, in class, I said, look, there's no offense to you, but if I could make money fishing, I would be somewhere else. Okay? The problem is I spend money fishing. I don't make money fishing. And if, if, I were, if I were like the Kevin Van Dams of the world, the, the great bass fishermen, you know, like I would love to be out there on the water fishing every day. And so there's nothing wrong with being a fisherman, but they just didn't have the same background that, that Levi had. And so because of their position, they didn't receive that same level of education. That could have been a point of contention as well but we never really see that. We, we don't see that. So I think that's another good point that we're kind of reading between the lines is they, they all got along with each other even though there were a good bit difference there. So Levi was an outcast, so to speak, among the Jewish nation. However, he seemed to turn back to his roots when he wrote the gospel. He focuses heavily on the Jewish faith and how it was always pointing to the arrival of Jesus and how Jesus fulfilled the law and brought the new law. Uh, there just seems to be a, a little bit different tone in his writing than what we read in some of the other writings, but it's much like the Gospel of Luke. Luke was physician. And so we read through the book of Luke, and it seems like maybe he focuses a little bit more on some of the miracles that Jesus performed and some of the healings, and that would make sense, right? Because he's a doctor, and he would pay more attention to that. So his background, uh, obviously Levi's background helped in establishing his narrative, the story that he wrote of, of Jesus. So that's the, the background, what we really know about Levi. Let's talk about some initial takeaways here. All right, first of all, Jesus called people from where they were as they were. Okay, they didn't have to jump through hoops. They didn't have to prove themselves to Jesus. He called them as they were. There was no seminary to attend. There was no religious schooling to complete. Jesus called people and they had an opportunity to become a Christ follower at that moment. Today, Jesus calls us where we are as we are. 
We don't get put on a probationary period to prove ourselves. We certainly have to make changes in our lives, but this comes over time. Remember, as newborn Christians, we are babes in Christ, and we desire the sincere milk of the word. We read in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And uh, Paul writing in 1 Corinthians the third chapter said, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready. Then after time, as we grow and we mature, we start eating the meatier things, right? We grow, we're constantly growing, we change. We should constantly be changing as Christians, trying to grow stronger, mature in Christ, make needed changes, and to draw closer to Christ and God. And the Hebrew writer in Hebrews, the fifth chapter said, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So I think it's important to note, Jesus calls us where we are. And we can become Christians, we can become followers of Christ right where we are and grow along the way. We don't have to do some special event or, or be watched for a period of time before we're allowed to become Christian. So I think there's a lot to be said in that too. We, we know that we're going to make mistakes along the way, but the point is we're constantly trying to grow. Now, Jesus was also criticized for associating with sinners. And this happens time and time again, right? This is not the only occasion where, where Jesus is called out. Why are you sitting over here eating with these sinners? Um, so many times we see Jesus associates with the sinners, he's eating with the sinners, he's healing the sinners, he's forgiving the sinners of their sins, and the Pharisees are all up in arms. They just cannot stand it. Why do you keep doing this? But isn't that kind of ironic? Because we're all sinners, right? And, and that's what the Pharisees couldn't see. They couldn't see that they themselves were sinners. They thought they were better than everybody else. But aren't you glad that Jesus associates with the sinners? Aren't you glad that Jesus associated with sinners when he was here on earth and that he associates with sinners still today? And we know that Jesus called the sick and he said that those uh, that he were calling needed spiritual healing. Why, why would I go out to those who are well? They don't need a physician, they don't need healing. And Jesus made that point clear in his rebuttal to the Pharisees and the scribes when they're calling him out and criticizing him for associating with the tax collectors, the sinners. And he called uh, the sick then. He's calling the sick today as well. He offers the spiritual healing that we all need. Let's look at a few more of these initial takeaways. So, I mentioned this already, but the Pharisees, they thought that they were better than everybody else. Remember back when uh, the, uh, the Pharisees, on another occasion, uh, they had called Jesus out. And uh, Jesus tells a parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Isn't that kind of ironic? He tells a, a parable in Luke the 18th chapter of the Pharisee and the tax collector and they both went to the temple to pray. So Luke 18 verse 9 begins says he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He, but he beat his breast, saying, 
God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the Pharisees, they, they thought that they were better than, than everyone else, and we, we see that uh, later on we'll come back around and, and talk about that a little bit more. But question for us is, do we ever play the sin comparison game? Okay, It's easy to compare ourselves with others and their sins, and we do this to make ourselves feel better about where we are in our relationship with God. It happens all the time, right? Uh, do we try to prop ourselves up based on what others do? Sure we do, right? We're all probably guilty of this at some point. So I'm, I'm not as bad as he is. I don't do th the things that she does. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing here. They thought themselves to be better than everyone else, and they promoted themselves as being more righteous than everyone else. But the truth is that we all need Jesus. Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all sin and we all need Jesus. Okay, some more initial takeaways here. Levi must have had some bit of influence over his colleagues because we see that the other tax collectors also came to the dinner. Okay, Jesus said, come follow me. And then next we read that Matthew's inviting him into his house, preparing this great feast. And it says the other tax collectors and other people were there as well. So not only did Levi invite Jesus into his home, but the other tax collectors came as well. What do we think about this? It's a good opportunity for Jesus. Absolutely. Okay. Perhaps, and this is some bit of speculation, but you think about maybe they were taking advantage, the other tax collectors, maybe they were taking advantage of this opportunity to dine with Jesus as well. Because you think about it, it was probably unlikely due to their occupation as tax collectors that they were ever invited to eat with other Jews. And now they had an opportunity to go back and eat with some of their own. And so they think, you know, the, the, the Romans don't like us, the Jews don't like us, but here is this man, a Jewish man, and all his Jewish friends, and we have an opportunity to go eat with them. And so they probably took advantage of that. And I find it interesting, too, uh, another takeaway is that they all reclined at the table with Jesus. So they, they were all there, they reclined at the table, and this simply could mean that they all gathered around the table for the meal, or it could also indicate that being around Jesus did not make them feel uncomfortable. They were comfortable going to the table and eating with Jesus. And we're not really told of the conversation that Jesus had with them, but we know Jesus was always teaching a lesson in some way. Jesus was always using the opportunity that he had at hand to heal the brokenness of all the people that he encountered. And I believe that Jesus would not have wasted away an opportunity to openly speak with them about their salvation as well. And so this was a great opportunity for all these men to be together and be in the presence of Jesus and to have an opportunity for, for their healing as well. Not, not just Matthew or, or Levi. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Remember Zacchaeus, right? Another tax collector that Jesus dined with. In Luke, the 19th chapter, it says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. 
And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Who was they? Uh, going back to the Pharisees again, all the other people, right? Uh, the scribes and the religious leaders of the day. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. They've already seen this before. Why are they so surprised? He keeps doing this, and they keep, keep grumbling against him. You think that they would have, have learned by now. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So it's uh, an, another great event, great story uh, of a man who's being healed of his brokenness here. But Jesus had a way of meeting people on their level and teaching unlike any man who has ever lived. His teachings opened their hearts and minds and the eyes of people so that they could change their lives. Now, the problem was with the Pharisees that their hearts had already grown too hard to accept Jesus, but those who had good hearts were touched by the message that he delivered. So what can we learn from all of this? Some lessons from, from Levi. He left everything. Levi left everything. Jesus called him. And uh, he said, follow me. And says, no, he got up and he left everything. Everything, everything. He left everything. What have we left for Jesus? Have we left everything for Jesus? Are there things standing between us and Jesus? Remember the rich young ruler when he met Jesus? He was seeking salvation as well. And he told Jesus, look, I've kept all the commandments, right? I've done all of this. And Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he went away sorrowful because he could not part with his riches. Levi, however, immediately left everything and followed Jesus. So what have we left for Jesus? Have we left a job? Have we left behind wealth and riches? Have we left behind pleasures of this world? Have we left behind friends and family so that we could follow Jesus? Think about this. If Levi had stayed in his position, it is likely that he could have collected riches and wealth beyond what most people of that, that day could ever have fathomed. He's going to be a very rich man. Okay? Rather, he left the riches of this world to live a life of poverty with Jesus. He traded his life of luxury here on earth for an everlasting reward. We don't know a lot about Levi's life as a disciple of Christ and as an apostle outside of writing the Gospel of Matthew. It, it is believed that uh, he continued to preach for about 15 years after Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended back to heaven. And he, like most of the other apostles, became a martyr. And that, that is what is believed. Had he remained a tax collector, he would have lived a very comfortable life here on earth. He would have amassed great riches. He would have been protected by the Roman government for whom he worked. Rather, he gave it all up to be a follower of Christ. All it took was him simply accepting the invitation that Jesus gave. Follow me. Do we know if he had a previous life? I mean, if he was being healed before, he would have stayed. We, we don't know. This, this is the, the, the first that we know uh, of the encounter there. So there's, there's really, the background is, is very little. We don't know. But we know that Levi saw the bigger picture, right? Undoubtedly, he knew that the riches of this world would fade, and he traded it all so that he could live that eternal life of luxury. What have we left behind for Jesus? Are we still trying to hold on to something in this world, or are we willing to leave it all to follow Jesus? So, first of all, Levi left 
everything. We also see that Levi invited Jesus into his home. Have we invited Jesus into our homes? Levi made a great feast for Jesus, not simply, you know, a, a simple meal. He didn't offer him, you know, a, a sandwich and a glass of water. It says it was a great feast, right? I find it interesting the wording or the phrasing here, and I believe that he knew that this was a special occasion. He knew that this was no ordinary man that had come into his house. He provided a great feast, and, and perhaps because he wanted to give the best that he had for Jesus. Now, I enjoy a great meal as, as much as anyone. You can, you can ask my wife, my, my father-in-law, some of you I've dined with before. Look, I, I enjoy a, a great meal, but I also enjoy simple foods as well. Right um, there's there's a, a golf course that uh, uh, my father-in-law we play at, and they have the best chicken salad sandwiches. And it seems simple, but I but I really like it. And every time we go there, I get a chicken salad sandwich. It, it isn't a great feast, but I really enjoy it. There are a lot of simple things that that I really enjoy. I, I like a good hamburger. I, I like Koneka sausage dogs. That, you know, so if you invite me in, into your house and you give me a Koneka sausage dog, I'm going to think it's a great feast, okay? But when Jesus comes into your house, you need to provide the best for Jesus. That's exactly what Levi did here. He prepared a great feast for his guests. There's another thought to this as well. He had just been called by Jesus. Perhaps he's celebrating that he had found the Savior. He's throwing a celebration for himself, for Jesus, for his friends, that he had salvation. Perhaps he's gathering all his tax collector friends together, and maybe he's telling them goodbye. Maybe he's telling them, hey, this is it. This is this is final meal, last meal with you guys, because I've got a new life. So somewhat of a retirement party for himself. This great feast. He's leaving the profession. He's beginning a new life. And so there's reason to rejoice because he knew things were going to be different. There's also reason to celebrate and rejoice that a lost soul is being brought home at this point. In Luke, the 15th chapter, we read of uh, three parables that, that Jesus teaches, right? The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. I, I, I encourage you that throughout the whole book of, of, of Luke, it's just very interesting to, to see some of this. But if you go back and you read the first few verses there in Luke, the 15th chapter, guess what the Pharisees and scribes were doing? They were grumbling against Jesus. Reading those first two, three, four verses there of Luke chapter 15, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled and complained that Jesus was eating with sinners. Like, like it was just a common thread. Like by now you think they would realize, yeah, he's going to do it. But they continued to complain. And so Jesus goes on to tell these three parables. And remember what happened at the end of the parable of the prodigal son? What did the father do for the son? Killed the, the fatted calf, right? A feast. The big banquet. That's right. Celebration. My son was lost and he's home again. He was dead and now he's alive. And think about this with, with Matthew. The great feast that he prepared for Jesus. Time for celebrating. And we should celebrate as well. And the father celebrates with us when we're lost and we return home. The question is, do we celebrate Jesus in this same manner when we find Jesus? Are we excited for Christ? Are we offering up a feast for Jesus? Now, having Jesus in our homes is important, but more than this, you know, think about inviting someone into your home then and even today that, that's a sign of respect and love. So I don't know about you, but I don't just 
randomly invite anybody in, into my home, right? Uh, so we invite those that we're close friends and family with, and Levi, by inviting Jesus into his home, was inviting Jesus into his life and into his heart. This was an intimate setting. But that was not something that he wanted to, to take lightly, especially during those times. Uh, it would have been considered a great honor to be invited into someone's home. That meant that you had a close relationship with that person. Even above that, he was sharing a meal with Jesus. And that was the closest of relationships. So it's already a close relationship to invite someone into your home, but you want to draw them even closer, sit around the table and eat with them. That, that was as tight-knit as it could get in the first century. And so that's why the Pharisees were so upset. How could Jesus, this man who considers himself to be the Savior, go and share a meal and have this intimate relationship with tax collectors and sinners? How could he have uh, do such a thing with these filthy, dirty people? That's the way they were looking at it. But Jesus has an open invitation for everyone. And if we will accept that invitation, then he will have that same kind of intimate relationship with us as well. Levi, saw, Levi, he saw the importance of the invitation that Jesus had offered when he was called to follow him. In, in return, Levi opened himself up in the most intimate of ways by inviting Jesus into his home and preparing the feast at his table for him. It didn't get any more closer or more special than that. So Levi was reciprocating the invitation that Jesus had offered by allowing himself to draw as close to Jesus as he could. Are we inviting Jesus into our homes and to our tables today? And third, we see that Levi made a change in his life. Have we made changes in our lives? I mentioned earlier that you don't have to go to some special spiritual training or religious training or education to become a child of God. Uh, you don't have to be uh, put on probationary period to see if you're going to make it or not. You know, a lot of the, the companies that I go and work with, uh, they hire temporary workers to come into the workforce. And, there, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. But they, they do that for a particular reason. They bring them in for about 90 days and they're on a probationary period to see if they can make it in the workforce. And they're not on their payroll, and so if the workers don't make it, or they don't fit in, or they don't, you know, the, the employer doesn't like that person, guess what? In the 90 days, they just call up the temp agency and say, hey, don't send them back. We're not gonna hire them, okay? That's not the way it works with Jesus. We become Christians and then we start making that transformation in our lives. And we should constantly be growing as Christians. And we have already read several passages that, that point to this. The apostles were not perfect. And, and Jesus knew that. Uh, they made lots of mistakes along the way. Uh, aside from uh, Judas, and we know what happened with him, they all continued to grow and mature throughout their lives. They were human just like us. And Jesus doesn't call us when we are perfect and have everything right. If that were the case, we would never get called. Levi made a drastic change with his physical life the moment that Jesus called him. He left everything and he made a change in his life. He left a lucrative position that he had. But more importantly, he made a spiritual change in his life. After he was called, he didn't hesitate. Uh, unlike others that we read of, remember uh, when Paul is meeting with Felix over in Acts, the 24th chapter? Felix has the same invitation. They're talking about salvation and they're talking about Felix getting his life right with God and with Christ. And uh, we're told that Felix was alarmed. That's the, the verbiage that, um, uh, that, that I read in Acts chapter 24. It says Felix was alarmed. 
he told Paul to go away, and when he had opportunity, he would call for Paul again. He had an invitation to come to Christ, but he chose not to take it. Levi had an invitation, and he made that change in his life. So we have an invitation to dine with Christ Jesus. Are we willing to be like Levi? Are we willing to leave everything for Christ? Are we willing to invite him into our homes, into our table, prepare a feast, the best that we have for him? Are we making the changes that we need in our lives? Questions, comments? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he, he mentioned that Zacchaeus, the son of Abraham. Right. They were actually crucified Jesus that day. Right. So he mentioned that about a tax collector was the son of Abraham and they they did that kid. Sure. Ab absolutely. Uh yeah, and, and I think, you know, going back to my point earlier, I mean Jesus knew their hearts and and, and he knew that they were moldable and that, that they could serve in that, that role. Um you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and, and now, like you said, there would have been, if, if he had called some of the Pharisees, there would have been nothing wrong with that. But I think that he knew that they had already gotten to the point that their heart was too hard. And, and I do think, I understand what you're saying exactly. You know, Jesus is coming in and he's teaching something that's foreign to them, okay, because they, they were going to look at it, you know, the, the letter of the law, right down to the, to the last dot, to the last um, punctuation mark in the law. They were going to try to follow that. And what did Jesus do? He came in and he said, no, you got to go above and beyond that, right? Love your enemies. Do, do good to those who, who curse you. And it, it's not just about... The, the law here, y'all are so caught up on this, it's about having the right heart and the right relationship with, with God. And so he, he called him out on that several times. Yes, sir. So the Pharisees also were, I guess, jealous because they're, they've been, you know, following the law to the letter. And there's these tax collectors and folks who have been amassing great wealth and stuff and sinning just openly and mm -hmm. doing just like, you know, everybody knew. Sure. <laughs> so there's there's this jealousy that's there, and, and y'all may somebody's impression, I'm sure, but 
Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point as well. I mean, and that, that would have been an opportunity for them just to sit down and have a cordial conversation with Jesus about things, but they didn't even take advantage or opportunity of that. They didn't want to, they, they didn't like Jesus because he's over there with all the sinners. Um, but G Jesus clearly says, you know, he didn't, he didn't come to call the righteous, right? And um, I think that's interesting because nobody's righteous, right? And until we're with God and then in the eyes of God through Christ Jesus. But um, he was coming to heal all the brokenness of the people. right he was done he was done with it he had an opportunity and I wonder about that too you know was this an opportunity maybe that had been weighing on him his his Jewish upbringing and his background and now he's in this position doing things he shouldn't and now he's got an opportunity to to be with Jesus and change his life and maybe like oh I'm taking advantage of this I, I don't know but we know that he left everything and um I'm sure the other tax collectors probably came over and <laughs> collected it all up for him. Uh, they didn't let it just sit there. But, uh, yeah, he could have gotten in trouble for that, okay, because he's working for the Roman government. Or if the, the Roman government gets mad at him. But he didn't care at that point, right? He was willing to, to leave it all for Jesus. Yep. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. Well, I appreciate all the comments uh, tonight. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, we, we certainly um, have several we need to, to remember. Uh, Braxton Tillman especially, let's, let's remember uh, him um, as he continues to, to recover. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll dismiss. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for an opportunity to look into your word again. We're thankful for... Uh, this example that we have from Levi, who was uh, willing to, to leave everything, willing to uh, make the changes that he needed in his life, willing to invite Christ into his home, into his life, into his heart. And uh, Father, we pray that we may uh, follow in that example. We pray for those who are hurting and struggling. We pray especially for uh, Braxton as, as he continues to heal. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, you would be with all of us. Uh, help us to keep our focus on Christ. Uh, help us to um, glorify you in everything that we do. Be with us throughout this night and the rest of this week until we meet again. Watch over us and care for us. In Christ's name we pray.